Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts Channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. We were off last week, but we are back with our full usual schedule starting right now. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery. And what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's case was suggested by brain scratcher Arvid Ziegler and is called Soul Eater and the Runaway Devil. The town of Medicine Hat in Alberta, Canada, is a beautiful city located along the South Saskatchewan River. Along with the natural beauty offered by the river and its tributaries, the town also offers parks and museums and is located only 25 miles or 40 kilometers from the Badlands Guardian geological feature. This natural formation seems to show a head wearing a feathered headdress that you can only see from above, but not while directly on the ground. The Richardson family love to take advantage of this natural beauty. Mark and Deborah, along with their two children, a 12-year-old we will call Jane and an eight-year-old named Jacob, had only lived in the area for about three years, but were known to most of their neighbors through backyard fence conversations and hellos in public. During the summer, if they weren't motorbiking together, they were playing ball in their backyard. On April 22, 2006, the family played games in their yard before they closed out their day with Mark barbecuing for dinner that evening. At noon the next day, Jacob's best friend stopped by the house and knocked on their door to see if he could play, but received no answer. As he walked away, he decided to look in a basement window to see if anyone was home. In shock, he realized that he did see someone, but they weren't moving. After he ran home and told his mother, she called the police. When officers arrived, they found the bodies of Mark and Deborah in the basement. Both appeared to have been stabbed to death, and the basement was covered in blood. When officers traveled upstairs, they found the body of eight-year-old Jacob lying in his bed. He, too, appeared to have been stabbed to death. That was when investigators noticed the family pictures on the walls that also showed the family with a daughter. They found out that the pictures were of 12-year-old Jane. When the house and surrounding area were searched again and no trace of her was found, they began to fear that Jane had been abducted by the murderer. For the rest of that day, police had the street leading to the home completely blocked off. Tracking dogs were used to search everywhere, including alleys, gardens, and garbage receptacles, while investigators processed evidence in the home. As pleas were sent to the media asking for the public in their help in finding her, investigators began to question those who knew the Richardsons. The pictures at home showed Jane looking just like a normal Catholic school honor student. Everyone else painted a very different picture. Investigators found that in 2005, Jane had become enamored with goth culture and traded in her traditional school uniform for clothes that were mostly black. She also started to wear dark makeup. She chased after men much older than her. In January of 2006, she met a young 23-year-old man named Jeremy Stanky at a concert. Jeremy came from a poor family. His mother was an alcoholic, and her partners were known to be abusive to him. His living situation caused him to be bullied in school, and by the age of 13, he had been diagnosed with depression and hyperactivity. In the 10 years that followed, after dropping out of school and at least one attempt to end his life, Jeremy began to create a persona for himself. When he met Jane, he told her he was a 300-year-old werewolf, and he wore a vial of blood around his neck. Jane was already heavily into vampires and styled herself as one. Soon, her behavior changed drastically, and she became hostile to everyone around her, including teachers and others that she used to call friends. That was when her parents learned about her relationship with Jeremy. They were enraged by the fact that their daughter was secretly seeing a man much older than her and forbid her from seeing him again. As investigators searched her school locker for clues, they found a drawing of particular interest. In it, Jane drew herself and her family as stick figures going for a walk. As an angry Jane walks off in the distance to meet Jeremy, her family returns from their walk. Jacob plays in the yard with a sprinkler while Mark and Deborah sit nearby watching. Unbeknownst to them, Jane and Jeremy had filled the sprinkler with gasoline. In the next panel, they sneak up behind everyone and set them on fire. 
It had now started to look like she wasn't the victim of a kidnapping after all. When investigators continued their questioning, they learned something that sealed Jane and Jeremy's fate. One of the couple's friends claimed that the night of the murder, a party was held that Jane and Jeremy attended. There, they bragged about the killing of the Richardson family, and Jeremy was quoted as saying he had gutted them like a fish. Just 24 hours after the murders, police received information that the couple had been spotted laughing at a nearby diner 80 miles or 129 kilometers away in Leader, Saskatchewan. They were arrested without incident and charged with three counts of first-degree murder. Under questioning, Jane admitted to investigators that she was very unhappy at home. Once her parents forbid her from seeing Jeremy, the two turned to online chat rooms where she went by the username Runaway Devil and said that she was 15. Jeremy used the moniker Soul Eater. When her parents found out about the chat room visits, they took away her computer. After the family had attended counseling for a few months, they felt the situation had improved and gave Jane back her computer. That was when the couple started to plan her family's murder. Just a month before the killings, Runaway Devil sent this message to Soul Eater, quote, So I have this plan. It begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. On the 22nd, they sat and watched Natural Born Killers, feeling that the movie's portrayal of a couple in love who go on a bloody rampage would set the mood for their murders. This movie was one of Jeremy's favorites, and he considered it a love story. Late that night, Jeremy snuck into the Richardson's house while everyone was asleep. When a noise awoke Deborah, she came downstairs to the basement to investigate. Dressed in black and wearing a mask, Jeremy attacked. Mark came downstairs when he heard his wife scream and tried to defend her, but was overtaken by Jeremy and his knife. Under interrogation, their stories started to differ. In Jane's first confession, she claimed to have come home and found the bodies of her family. Then she claimed that Jeremy had killed everyone before changing her story again to say that she had killed Jacob out of mercy. Jeremy insisted that he had killed Mark and Deborah, but not Jacob. Both claimed that love was their motive. At her trial in June of 2007, Jane was asked why the two committed the murders. She said, I loved him so much, I thought it would bring us closer together. In July of 2007, Jane was found guilty on three counts of the first-degree murder of her family. She was sentenced to 10 years in jail, which was the maximum sentence allowed under Canada's Youth Criminal Justice Act. She was the youngest person ever convicted of multiple murders in Canada. For the first four years of her sentence, she was committed to a psychiatric hospital. The next four years, she spent on conditional community supervision while she attended Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta. Once her 10 years had been served, she was released from custody. Queen's Bench Justice Scott Brooker told her, I think your parents and brother would be proud of you. Clearly, you cannot undo the past. You can only live each day with the knowledge you can control how you behave and what you do each day. Now, in her mid to late 20s, Jane reportedly has undergone treatment and lives in a new town under a new name. In 2008, Jeremy pled not guilty to his charges, even though he had confessed multiple times. His defense team called him a love-struck, immature man who snapped in a drug and alcohol-fueled haze. They claimed that he would do anything for Jane. In December, he was convicted on all three charges and was sentenced to three life sentences in prison to be served concurrently. He'll be eligible for parole in 25 years. Since that time, he has also changed his name and now goes by Jackson May. When he was asked why he participated in the murders, he said, quote, When you find your soulmate, you do anything for them. Case cracked. I would like to thank the New York Daily News, The Globe and Mail, news.com.au, newspapers.com, Wikipedia, and the Vancouver Sun. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is to discuss it with us now. Christy, thank you for bringing this story to us, and uh, once again, just a thank you to the Brain Scratcher who suggested it, Arvid mm -hmm. Ziegler. 
Um, really interesting story with some important conditions that we need to touch on. But one of the first things I wanted to talk about was that the original news coverage on this kept Jane unnamed. Mm -hmm. So we decided to follow suit in that with today's script. To be honest, when you're talking about a 12-year-old being part of crimes of that nature in that way, for me, I'm wondering about social influence. I'm wondering about an adult being in that situation, uh, how that might have enabled some of her actions. And uh, we'll, we'll get more into that. It's interesting that both are found responsible, ultimately, but kind of to the point I was raising, the adult in the situation seems to be given a much heavier sentence in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there was a, a law on the children's side that kind of blocked how long that term could be. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think this kind of went the way it should go. But what do you think about that, Christy, this whole angle of a 12-year-old having to to deal with an adult uh, of this nature? It's really hard to wrap my mind around because everybody that she associated with seemed to be so much older than her. I mean, tw a difference between 12 and 20 is a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of growth that goes on in those years. And you you can't skip it. And if you get kind of caught up in... You know, I mean, your parents are always worried about you getting caught up in a bad circle and, mm -hmm. and just of peers. But here we're talking about a whole different situation. And I remember being young and kind of cracking into some older social groups. You get this feeling of like, oh, I'm more mature than my friends are because mm -hmm. these people get me and they're letting me be a part of their circle and all that. But in this situation, uh, it just, I mean... The story didn't even touch on the aspect about the potential of statutory rape or what's going on around that. Uh, mm -hmm. Did did you find anything about that at all? And No, not a mention. Yeah. And I would have thought there would have been. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about that because you would think that they'd probably want to get as many charges on this guy as possible and just keep him behind bars for as long as possible. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, there was some other information, it seemed, about possibly another adult that could have been part of this equation. Um Mm -hmm. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about this person, how they fit into this? Well, I know that she was associating with a lot of people in the chat rooms, but this particular person actually played a role in all of this. It was a 20-year-old 20 20 year named Casey Lancaster, and she was charged with accessory to murder, but the charges were dropped. She instead pleaded guilty to an obstruction charge for driving Stanky's truck to a secluded parking lot the day the bodies were found. And she helped to wipe down the interior while she also removed an expensive looking folding knife. She said the seats were stained, but she didn't know why. And she didn't know why Stanky had asked her to clean it out. She ended up getting one year house arrest as part of the plea bargain. And she was ordered to refrain from drugs and alcohol. So hopefully that year did her some good because. Yeah, I don't know how. Um... You participate in something like that. You don't know that it's blood. I mean, come on. Like, Everybody knows that stain. Yeah. Well, and you're cleaning up some random stain and removing this folding knife, which I think her excuse for removing, removing the folding knife was she said it looked expensive. So she wanted to make sure it didn't get stolen or something. Uh, like, yeah, the excuses don't seem to be holding up very well. No. I'm really surprised that she didn't get charged in this as well. Uh, heavier, I am too. At least. Yeah. Yeah, I am too. Uh, another thing, Christy, um, when I was going through this script, I was like, I feel like I've heard something in here before, and I've heard that before, and I've heard that before. How many crimes do we review where the movie Natural Born Killers comes up in it? it way more than it should. I'm seriously, yeah. seriously. And I actually even took a look. There's a Wikipedia page now specifically for tracking instances like this, and there's at least a dozen on there where there's some connection and it's usually the offenders saying that their favorite movie was Natural Born Killers or they watched it right before they went and did this or, um, and it's so weird. I'm not trying to suggest that that movie is responsible for these. Mm. I think it's likely the other direction. I think there's a fantasy of violence that exists within these people. And that movie seems to be a magnet in terms of giving them some type of outlet for fantasizing about that violence further or something yeah. along those lines. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it's really, really bizarre. What do you think's going on here on the mental aspect with this case? Well, I know that there was mental illness on the part of Stanky. 
And being in the situation that they were, she was listening to everything that he said. So, you know, their their little soundboard was each other. And that's never a good thing. But right. I felt like there were really three things here. One was Stanky's mental illness. Two was immaturity on both of their parts. And third could be folia do. That's where you have madness shared by two. We covered that in the Jameson family. Yeah, you know, it's it's like it doesn't matter how crazy or off the wall things start to get. Uh, once you start to fall in that pattern of just listening to each other, ev- anything becomes possible. I mean, these guys they didn't. It was like time meant nothing to them. They really believed they were as ageless as they said they were, right. and you know, they just knew they'd be together when they got out because they had forever. Yeah, yeah. Did you find any um, official diagnosis? for Stanky at all? I did not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the the past that he went through certainly suggests that he was likely dealing something. And we did get, mm-hmm. you know, hyperactivity. Um, but yeah. Wow. Yeah, it had progressed past that. Well, and to your point, this kind of fantasy tried to live through even their convictions. It seems like their romance continued into jail. T- mm-hmm. Tell us what happens around that. Well, according to the Vancouver Sun, the couple agreed through prison love letters to marry, but their relationship started falling apart when they both accused each other of killing Jacob. So it kind of crumbled after that. Wow. Wow. Oh, I don't know. Uh, This one I think is going to be keeping me up for a while. I'm going to be thinking about this case for a long time. It is. It's just, and the 12-year-old is what blows my mind. I just can't comprehend. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's just this heartbreaking aspect to this case. The parents seem to have tried pretty strongly to to figure this out, you know, Mm -hmm. learning about the relationship, taking away the computer, doing some counseling, starting to rebuild the trust, letting her have the computer back. Like, that seems like what most parents would think is is probably a good route for trying to head this off. But unfortunately, Mm -hmm. in this case, it does not go that way. Christy, thank you so much for all your hard work on this. We really appreciate it. And I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters Sandra Mangle and Think Mutiny Publishing. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee, like Raquel Quezada recently did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover. And we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit www.seriouslymysterious.com and remember to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. Please don't forget to subscribe here and hit that bell icon below if you'd like to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows. And of course... I'll be back with a new unsolved mystery for you this Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.